Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Podcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. Before we get started, I wanted to make sure you knew that we have a brand new addition to the Christian Heritage series in Charles Spurgeon's Lectures to My Students. Charles Spurgeon was an English Baptist minister famous as the Prince of Preachers. He was one of the most eloquent men of his day. He started charities, fought against liberalism, and endured depression with laughter and joy. Get lectures to my students from Charles Spurgeon today at canonpress.com. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 161. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you for paying attention. Uh, people sometimes thank me for the things I put out, and I, I thank them in return. No, no, thank you for paying attention, because that's the hard part. So, I want to begin by talking about uh, my latest book that just came out, uh, Ride Sally Ride. One of my grandkids just uh, recently finished reading it, and he commented that it was awfully cheerful for a dystopia. Yeah, okay. This book, Ride Sally Ride, is set a few decades in the future. The old America is hanging by a thread. Basically, the old America is a legal fiction by this point. The red states and the blue states are still technically together, but they're about ready to blow apart. The description is it's a, it's a book about true love and the crack up of the United States. So this is a crack up that spirals into absurdity at a number of different points, which is precisely where we are. I set the book a few decades in the future, and some people looking at it are considering what I was saying. What do you mean, few decades? It's more like a few months in in the future. It looks like we're picking up speed and we're almost there. So I would describe it as a dark comedy that is set in a dystopic future. But this dystopia has, uh, there's breathing space. There, there are places of light. There are places, there's, there's someone you, somewhere you could go. So the, here's the basic setup, and, and no, uh, there'll be no spoilers here. There's a young man named Asahel, and his um, friend winds up being, his girlfriend winds up being his wife by the end of the book, uh, is Stephanie. Uh, so Stephanie's not a Christian. Asahel, called Ace, is a Christian. Ace is, uh, lives in Colorado, a deep blue state uh, run by the, basically under the thumb of the Colorado Human Rights Commission. And Asa Hell's, Ace's uh, father is what might be called an uber evangelical, works for a Christian ministry and interested in evangelism and outreach. And a man moves in across the street from them, and this man introduces them to his wife, Sally, and his wife is a sex doll, a sex android. But he introduces her as his wife and is acting throughout as though she is an actual person. And, and uh, Asahel's father, Ace's father, wants to have them over because they need Jesus. And Ace responds upset. What do you mean they need Jesus? He needs Jesus, but there's no they there. What, you know, what, are you ta- <laughs> what are you talking about? One thing leads to another. This is all, I'm just giving you the setup in the first chapter. The first chapter, uh, Asahel works at a recycling plant. And the chap, that chapter ends with him having taken the sex doll to the recycling plant and compacts her. In the, this whole thing is intended to be a Phineas moment. Like uh, that, That's the setup for all the action that follows. There's this Phineas moment where Phineas uh, runs the couple who were copulating in this high-handed defiance. Phineas runs them through, and then that's a turning point in that whole story. Well, what happens is that Asahel compacts the sex doll, and there's a woke prosecutor there in Colorado who decides that Asahel needs to be charged with first-degree murder. And he has to be charged with murder because the doll was identified as a wife. Because she was identified by this, uh, this man as his wife, 
then the charge has to be murder. And we have to have the next great leap forward into human rights. So that's the setup. That's what happens by the end of chapter one. And everything that follows is the monkey shines of, of the trial, uh, the back and forth, the posturing, the positioning for the trial, and the political ramifications. The people in the red states are outraged that Asahel is being tried. The uh, blue states are outraged that he's not been uh, taken care of yet, and so on. So, it is a dark comedy, and yeah, I'd say it's a fair description. My grandson's uh, description of this as a cheerful dystopia is a, um, a fair enough description. So, Ride, Sally, Ride. I had a bunch of fun writing it, and I, I hope you have as much fun reading it. Here we are, episode 161, podcast, and we have come once again to our hamartiology section. Now, in our previous study last week, we looked at a word that was translated abominable, and here we have another one from the same word group. So this next word in our study of hamartiology is bedeluso, B-D-E-L-U-S-S-O, bedeluso, and it is a word that means abominable. There are two instances of this word being used in Scripture. The first is not the description of the sin itself, but rather a description of a hypocrite's pretense. So, in Romans 2.22, the hypocrite pretends to abhor idols. And the verb translated abhor here is our word. So, the hypocrite posture is preening himself and is posturing. He's pretending to be righteous. And a righteous man abhors idols. An I, a, a righteous man pretends to, to act as though idols are abominable. So the hypocrite is living one way, and in his public posturing, he's acting like he abhors idols, but his life betrays the fact that he's not. Uh, the other use is found in Revelation, and this is the use that is simply a description of the sin. No, and notice again, once again, we've seen with a bunch of sins in the New Testament, uh, sins are like grapes, they come in bunches. Notice the company that this sin keeps. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, there's our word, and the abominable, and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So, what's the cluster of sins? Fearfulness, unbelieving, murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. And then right in the middle of that is the abominable. So there's an early stage of sinning, which wants to keep all the normal, but wants to indulge in various tidbits on the side, like someone cheating on a diet, right? They want to reserve to themselves the right to sneak. They sneak a little porn or they sneak a you know, little unfaithfulness to their wife or they, they cut corners at work or the, you know, they want to be a little bit lazy. But they like the fact that society runs normally. They wouldn't like it if everybody did what they were doing on a wholesale level, all together on a broad scale. That would make life unlivable. And a lot of people want normal, respectable, middle-class living. They want life to go on predictably, but they want the right to sneak or snitch on the side. But there's also a turn in the road to depravity. That simply gives way to all the lust. That simply lets it go. The bottom falls out. When this stage is reached, the loathsomeness of the behavior is no longer a bug, but has become a feature. Fearful, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, whoremongers. These, these are people who are abandoned to the sin. Continuing with podcast episode 161, Canon Press has recently been issuing books in the Christian Heritage series, and the most recent one is Lex Rex by Samuel Rutherford. Samuel Rutherford, Lex Rex. Now, Rutherford is an interesting character. I wrote the, I wrote the forward to this book, and I really commend it to you. In a, a few weeks ago, I commended to you um, uh, another book in the Christian Heritage series, uh, Vindiciae Contra Tyrannus. A Vindication of Liberty Against Tyrants. That was written anonymously by a Huguenot writer in the 1500s. This book is a century later by Samuel Rutherford in the 1600s. Lex Rex means the law 
well, it could be the law is king or the law and the king. But basically, his thesis is the king uh, is subservient to the law and under it and is accountable. The king is not in classic, in the, in the divine right of kings theology, the king was accountable, but the king was accountable to God only. In Rutherford's thinking, the king was accountable basically to the law and to the people and to the constitutional framework of the society. Now, Rutherford, to the extent that he's known at all today, is generally known as a devotional writer. He was a great pastor. He was a a great theologian. He was one of the Scottish commissioners who went to the Westminster Assembly and uh, labored there. And his devotional work, his pastoral devotional work, is found in his letters, and um, and someone once went through those letters and culled out a number of the most notable, quotable sayings that he had that are just uh, lofty and wonderful and consoling and comforting. Rutherford was the one who said, uh, when I'm in the cellar of affliction, I look for God's choicest wines. When I'm in the cellar of affliction, I look for God's choicest wines. Someone, uh, well, as long as I'm here, let me plug another book. Uh, someone went through his his letters and pulled out a number of the best uh, devotional sayings or quotations and published them in a small book called The Loveliness of Christ. The Loveliness of Christ. If you look for it on Amazon, it can come. It comes in two forms. Uh, one is a gift, you know, like a nice, nicely bound gift um, book. It's a wonderful book to give, for, you know, for wedding present or. If someone's recently suffered a bereavement or, you know, that sort of thing, it's a, it's a real encouraging um, book. There's also a paperback version published by my dad's ministry, um, Community Christian Ministries, The Loveliness of Christ. It's a nice looking paperback. So that's Samuel Rutherford. Those are gems taken from his letters, and that's the devotional writing. But then if you turn from that to uh, Lex Rex, you find that that Rutherford was a tough-minded political theorist, uh, well-versed in Greek and Hebrew and in ancient history. Uh, And he argues very capably from Scripture that the king is not an unaccountable figure at the top of the human heap, like some sort of yertle the turtle. He is accountable. The king is under law. Now, after the Restoration, when Charles II was brought back and put on the throne, Rutherford was on his deathbed, and he was um, basically summoned to appear before Parliament to answer for his book. Uh, and he was, on, he was going to be tried for treason because of the argument that he presented in this book. Now, remember, Charles I had been beheaded earlier in the aftermath of the English Civil War. So you had Charles I, he was beheaded. Cromwell ruled for a little over a decade. And then after Cromwell died, his son Richard uh, couldn't hold it together. And then there was the restoration. Charles II was brought back. And when Charles II was brought back, Rutherford was arraigned on a charge of treason for the contents of this book. The contents of this book remain acutely relevant today. Christians need to recover Protestant evangelical Christians specifically, their heritage in Protestant resistance theology. So I would encourage you, if you want to do that, get Vindicii first. Read the, Vindicii is more accessible than Lex Rex is. Read Vindicii first, and, but also get Lex Rex and read through that, and you're going to find iron entering into your blood. Uh, this is a scriptural, well-thought-out, godly um, take on how the Christian should relate to the prince, how the Christian should relate to the president, and to Congress, and to all the authorities over us. So, uh, that, that's the exit. Get this book and read it, but read Vindicii first. So, Rutherford was sick and dying, and, um, and he was summoned to appear, and he sent a message back uh, that basically said, uh, I can't answer your summons. I've been summoned by a higher authority. Uh, and I'm going to appear there where few kings and great folk come. Mm-hmm. 